Today on IODP Expedition 342, Newfoundland. I think the liner, I think the liner jammed immediately and it stopped the forward stroke. What had happened is that we were trying to recover a complete record of the Eocene Oligocene transition where the Earth goes from being this really warm greenhouse into being a glaciated ice house. And it looked like there was this gap basically where the transition occurred in the interval between two cores from the first hole. So on the second hole we were trying to cover that gap. And when I woke up, everyone was saying, we didn't do it, we didn't get it. And so then there was a strategy that started to be put in place. Just drill all the way 200 meters below the seafloor and just spot core, just take a few cores to try to capture that boundary interval. And this whole operation will take us somewhere in the range of maybe 18, 20 hours. So we're talking about basically expending one of our days on this little effort to try to bridge that gap. So we had this big plan that everyone was trying to figure out how we could do it because we really wanted to recover it. Um, and then as I was trying to figure out these specific details of how I would know where to stop drilling before we could spot for, I started looking a little bit more carefully at the data from this previous hole that everyone thought had failed to recover the critical interval. And that looked to me like actually we might have recovered the critical interval after all. It was very subtle data, difficult to interpret, but I thought that it was possible that we had it. I swear, if we yeah, split she's it, in there right and now. we see that, then we know. <laughs> yeah. And as soon as I made that suggestion, it kind of just sparked this flurry of activity because it really would have necessitated a big change in plans. Um, and so then we actually ended up splitting a core out of sequence that would have been this core that would have bridged that critical yeah, gap. And then you know you can see everybody around the table just staring at it and just arguing really over whether or not one yeah. thing is like another. Now the other possibility is it's one of these. No, no, it's that no the question would be if it's, if it's in... Well, it could be like in here. So we're looking for the signal of Antarctic glaciation, maybe glaciation in the northern hemisphere by looking for flickers in calcium carbonate preserved on the seafloor in the North Atlantic. And that basically reflects uh, variations in the acidity of the ocean and how much carbonate the ocean can store. The other thing that's important here is that we could spend a whole day, basically about $100,000, to go and make sure that we have a complete record. But we may actually already have it on the table in front of us. And so that's what the excitement's about. It was very exciting because it showed how everyone's input was really important to determine whether in fact that core had done what we wanted it to in the first place. Um, and in the end, of course, we decided that it had and that it wouldn't be necessary to go down and get a sea hole after all. This is what has been described as the mother of all climatic ships in the last 65 million years of life on this planet. Earth becomes glaciated for the first time, right here. It was very stressful at times, but it was exciting. It kind of reminded me of what we were out here to do, which was to make real-time decisions. I mean, if you're just doing it back on shore, you don't feel the pressure the same way, and it doesn't feel quite as exciting and high intensity. And I think everyone likes to have that experience in their job. And you know, in this case, it was just the perfect combination of all of what you expect from sort of high drama, high stakes science. And, and so that was really exciting. Welcome to Titanic Tales. When the Titanic sank in April 1912, there was huge public outcry because at the time Titanic was the largest ship and supposedly unsinkable. So when news spread of the sinking and the horrendous loss of life, people started to ask questions like, how did this happen? Why did this happen? But more importantly, how do we prevent this from happening again? And in 1914, they introduced the International Convention for Safety of Life at Sea, or as we know it, SOLAS. And the main objective of SOLAS back then and still is today, minimum standards in construction, equipment, and operation of all ships at sea. Uh, Dan, you know where Dan is? <laughs> Emergency training and drills are SOLAS requirements designed to prepare crews for any emergency. And that's why on the Joyous Resolution, there are so many different types of drills. We have lifeboat drills, firefighting drills, man overboard drills, helicopter emergency drills, and these are just a few. 
So, in an ironic way, the loss of the Titanic was an accident waiting to happen. But the lessons learned are still very much applied today on all ships worldwide. Safety of life at sea is something we take very seriously, as was the tragic sinking of the Titanic, a milestone in maritime safety regulations. I've tried to link this expedition with my basic research. For that, my scientific interest is to try to find impact layer. When an impact occurs on Earth of a diameter of more than 10 kilometers, the energy released upon impact may be sufficient to throw debris at very high altitude. And this molten material often takes aerodynamic shape, similar to liquid drops suddenly frozen. And this small bubble of natural silicate glass can fall 7,000 kilometers around the impact crater. That's why we can find it in deep sea cores. What we have here is the, uh, the evidence of the Chesapeake Bay impactor. In other words, there was a big meteorite impact right in the middle of Chesapeake Bay. And this was actually made famous in the 1970s, I think, by a scientist by the name of Billy Glass. And he found a lot of ejecta from this off the east coast of the US. And in fact, it was ironic, this name was Billy Glass because he was finding these little glass spheroids in this impact layer. So we'll be looking to see whether we can find some of the same ejecta. Please confirm this on camera, but what do you have? I think we're in the AC in Dan. I feel like we just scored a big prize. And what's really nice is that we've got lots of carbonate um, in this sample. And that's really unusual for the Eocene Oligocene boundary interval. Well, we just got the uh, Eocene Oligocene boundary, which we weren't sure we were going to get, so we're all pretty excited about it. And when it came in, then we cut off the end of that core, and it gave us that heart shape, or a smile. It was like, the Eocene loves you. So that's uh, this period of time when, when these ice sheets first get triggered down on Antarctica. And one of the neat things about being here in the North Atlantic is that we can perhaps assess what was going on at high latitude uh, in the north at the same time. That's been a difficult thing to assess until uh, this expedition. No man, it's the real deal. What do you guys find? Gold? <laughs> <laughs> All right, struck it rich. <laughs> we can't be okay. seen. Gold? Pirate. Pirate. So it's not real gold. Yeah. False <laughs> <laughs> <It's not> gold. Tech <laughs> false. be keeping an eye on Mr. Snaggleton, the Ambulocetus. He may be an ancient whale, but he can't go swimming out there. Look, we need to make sure we stay out of the science and stay out of the lifeboats. All right, let's go back downstairs. I don't want to get in anyone else's way. That seam out is this one right here, and that's the seafloor. We're sitting here at the gateway, basically, to the Arctic and all the water that flows out of the Arctic has to come past this point. So this is a, in a global context, is a perfect place to poke a hole to sort of understand how the North Atlantic and the Arctic work in relationship to the global hole. And uh, get the expanded section in the core of the slide. I, I guess we collect information on what is on the sea floor. We take uh, core samples, we take geophysical information that allows us to kind of see into the bottom uh, so we have some idea of what's down there. And then we put all that information together and then we kind of guess uh, where to poke our drill string. And it turns out this particular cruise has been all about adaptation because we started off drilling this big pile of mud thinking that it was 40 or 50 million years old and it turned out to be 20 million years old. And so that meant that we had to adjust our thinking about where to go. 
It turned out all right though, because we were able to get these just fantastically detailed records of Earth history in the past. And the main issue is that that feature there can be traced all over the place. When we discover something that is the way I expected it to be, it's often kind of boring because, well, you already kind of knew it, right? In order to have come up with a correct uh, expectation about something. And so it's when you discover something brand new, something that's really unexpected, when you're wrong, uh, that is the exciting part of science.